find it important to have your Bible open at the passage we read together at the end of John 6, passage which I was saying last Sunday evening is a sequel, really, to the preceding incident of the miracle that Jesus performed in feeding the 5,000, and a sequel also to that highly significant and fairly lengthy exposition that Jesus gives on the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He says, he who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And the last 11 verses are a kind of sequel to that whole episode. But they are in no sense merely a postscript and therefore unimportant. There are many ways in which these verses could be the most important part of this whole period of Jesus' ministry for these disciples who gather together to hear him. I have little doubt either that these verses could be the most crucial part of the whole of this study of John chapter 6 for many of us here this evening. For the first disciples of Jesus, it was in the most literal sense a turning point. You can see that if you glance at verse 66. From this time, John says, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed Jesus. In fact, there are two groups of people quite distinct from each other woven into this whole section. There are what John calls the disciples, who were obviously a fairly loosely knit company of people who had gathered around Jesus and followed him and listened to him, and over a period of time, attached themselves at various levels to him. But then there was another group of people whom John calls specifically the twelve in verse 67. You do not want to leave two, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And I think the distinction is that the twelve were those Jesus had especially chosen and bound to himself, whereas the disciples were a fairly disparate group of people with very little real commitment to Jesus in general. But they were both of them, you see, facing the same critical issue, and that was about where their spiritual future would lie they had come to a particularly critical moment in their lives, and more precisely, what was going to be decided one way or the other at this juncture in their life was whether they would go on with Christ or whether they would turn back. That was really the crucial issue that confronted both these groups, the somewhat less committed, the disciples, as John calls them, and the twelve too, as Jesus thrusts the issue before them and says, do you also want to turn back? It was for all of them, in some real sense, a crossroads of life. And they had to decide which way they were going to see their future spiritually in relation to God. Standing still for any length of time was not really an option, nor is it for any of us. The simple truth is that most of us are either going on or going back. We may stagnate for a short period of time, 
But the pattern of our life is that we are moving either in one direction or the other. And there are seasons of life which can really be formative in this sense for the rest of our days. They sometimes come along with major changes in our personal history, for example. When we leave school or college or university, when we leave home and set up on our own with a new freedom and a new necessity of making choices and setting out priorities and determining just what the shape of our life is going to be. There are things that press this upon us. Starting a new job. Choosing a wife or husband can so often be catalysts that force us to decide what is the spiritual shape of my future going to be. For the disciples and the twelve, it wasn't really any of these things. It was a crisis that was precipitated because of truth. They had been listening to an extended address by Jesus when he laid down certain cardinal Christian doctrines. And it is immediately after this, do you notice in verse 60, John points it out to us, lest there be any misunderstanding. On hearing this, many of his disciples says, said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And what Jesus was expanding upon was such truths as his incarnation, that he was God come in the flesh. In verse 33, for example, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. The necessity of his atoning death. In verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The necessity of saving faith to appropriate his death. In verse 53, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He is pressing upon them the necessity of personal dealing with him if they are going to benefit from all that he is as the bread of life. And perhaps, in some senses, most characteristically through this whole chapter, he is emphasizing the sovereignty of God in salvation. Look at verse 44. No one, says Jesus, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And on hearing all of this, and much more, many of the disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? They had listened to the teaching. They sat under his ministry for this prolonged period. And then they said, this is hard stuff. Who is able to receive this? Now, let me explain to you that it was not hard to understand. They could understand it all right. Someone said a little while ago in my hearing, the parts of the Bible that really trouble me are not the bits I don't understand, but the bits I do. And it was not that they couldn't understand it, not hard in that sense, but hard to receive, hard to embrace, hard to accept and live by. Now, if you look at verses 60 and 61, you will probably conclude that the grumbling and murmuring that Jesus' teaching produced was going on behind Jesus' back. 
but he knew about it and asks them in verse 61, does this offend you? On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Is this a stumbling block to you? Well, Jesus says, you haven't heard anything yet. In verse 62, he goes on to say, What if I were to tell you that the Son of Man is not only going to come down from heaven and give his flesh, his life, for the sins of the world, but that he is going to rise from the grave and ascend to the right hand of the Father from whom he came? What if I were to tell you this, says Jesus? What if you are to see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? You see, I think what really offended them was that they were discovering that Jesus' teaching implied that only God was anything in Christian salvation, that Jesus had a jealous regard for God's power and God's glory and God's provision for salvation, and man was humbled in the presence of such truth to the point where he is nothing but a beggar in the presence of God, holding out empty hands to receive the bread of life. And they were not ready to give God his place and to let God be God in the salvation that Jesus was teaching them about. Now, that's a very important issue because, you see, it is not merely an intellectual issue that these people were discovering themselves wrestling with the idea that God alone was sovereign in salvation. Only he could draw them to Jesus. Only he had the bread of life which they needed. This was a moral and spiritual reality which Jesus is thrusting into the center of their life. And the thing that it challenged more than anything else was the place of self in their lives. And I think this is what Jesus is exposing and what his teaching is revealing and what they are finding a hard thing to receive. Now it's this challenge that Jesus presses upon them from verse 63. And there are four truths particularly that he insists upon. And it's significant that they are found here from verse 63 onwards. He says, does this truth offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? And then he lays down four fundamental truths which he insists upon as of the very essence of salvation. And there is in some sense a connection between them which brings us to the place where we discover Jesus' determination, as it seems, to humble human pride. First, the necessity of regeneration or the new birth by the Spirit. Verse 63, the Spirit gives life, says Jesus. The flesh counts for nothing. Now, he is speaking about the Spirit's giving life in the whole context of the new birth. 
It is the Spirit who brings us into spiritual life. We can no more arrange or procure our spiritual birth than we can arrange or procure our physical birth. For this central, fundamental thing, without which we have no spiritual life, Jesus says it is the Spirit who gives it. The flesh counts for nothing. Now that's a fundamental principle. And many of them found it hard to bear. Because you see there is something native in the human heart that longs to be able to contribute to our salvation. To shrink from this idea of being humiliated before God to the place where everything that we need, He has to do for us. And Jesus says that it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. Notice the second truth on which he lays emphasis. It is the instrumentality of the Word of God in regeneration. The second half of verse 63 the words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Now, do you see what he is saying? He is saying these very words that I have been speaking to you, this teaching that you have been listening to, this is the instrument that God uses to produce the new birth. How are we born again? We are born again not by corruptible seed, but by the living and abiding Word of God. It is through the words of God that spiritual life comes. Now do you see the danger of people resisting and refusing the Word of God as Jesus had spoken it to them? He says, the words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. And it is the spirit who gives life. How does he do it? He does it through the words I speak to you. Now that's the great importance of the central place of the word of God in all our evangelism and in all our thinking about salvation because it is through the living and abiding Word of God that regeneration, the new birth, comes. Notice the third truth that Jesus presses upon them. It is the necessity of personal faith in salvation, verse 64, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life, yet there are some of you who do not believe. Now why is it then that they are without life? Why is it that they are outside of the kingdom? Why is it that they are turning back from Jesus? I'll tell you why it is. It is that they refuse to believe. Now, do you see the point about this? True New Testament faith is an acknowledgement that I cannot save myself, that I have nothing to contribute to my own salvation, and that I must flee to Jesus for it and lay hold of him personally and for myself. Now, many of these people were good religious people. They were people who had been brought up steeped in religion. They were people who had attachments to organized religion. But Jesus again and again insists, you must believe for yourself you must feed on the bread of life. You must eat this flesh. You must drink this blood. He goes to any length to press upon them that it is a personal dealing with a personal Savior that they need. 
My dear friends, it is our greatest bugbear in Scotland. Fed by generations of misunderstanding. That it is not a link with the church. It is not our outward observance. It is not our upbringing or family or whatever. It is our personal dealing with a personal Savior that brings us salvation. And many of them turned away and no longer followed after him. That's when they stopped listening. May I ask you this evening, when do you stop listening? What is it that makes you turn back from the words of Jesus? His own insistence on the necessity of regeneration. You must be born again. That stuck in my throat as a young man, for months on end. And I was on the point of turning back and going no longer with Jesus for this very reason. I thought that belonged to the Plymouth Brethren. I was a good parish churchman. And I thought this was something that belonged to a sect. And then I discovered that the whole talk about being born again came from the lips of Jesus, of all people. Is that where you stop listening? On the instrumentality of the Word of God in regeneration, is that where you stop listening? in the necessity of personal faith to embrace salvation, is that where you stop and turn back? Or the fourth thing, in verse 65, Jesus went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him the sovereignty of God in salvation. Now, whatever else that truth does, I tell you the main thing it does, it humbles human pride. So, from verse 6 to 6, from that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. There is no question, of course, that at an earlier time they were undoubtedly and genuinely greatly attracted to Jesus. They had followed him in large numbers. The story of Jesus' ministry is that it began with great crowds and gradually began to filter down into smaller and smaller numbers until ultimately he is left absolutely alone. I suppose they would have been attracted by the popularity of Jesus for a time. Because Jesus was popular at one stage in his ministry. The common people heard him gladly. And people flocked around him. And they may have been attracted by that. I think they were attracted by the novelty of his teaching. We have never heard it like this before, they said. This is new. Extraordinary. Have you heard him? This latest preacher, do come, they would say. And they would all gather together and listen to Jesus, the novelty of it. But popularity wears off, and novelty wears off. And many of them were attracted by the superficiality of their own understanding. They thought he was come to be the king that they had looked for. And they didn't understand so much of what Jesus was saying to them. And he stopped them again and again and again in a way that seems extraordinary to us. When you've got a crowd, keep it. But Jesus said, listen, count the cost. 
Don't go on. Don't come after me until you have counted the cost. What man of you goes to war without sitting down first and counting the cost? What man builds a tower until he has counted the cost to see whether he has finished it? Lest all men think he is a fool. And Jesus turns to the twelve in verse 6 to 7 when many of the disciples had turned back and he says, do you also want to turn away or go back? And Peter says in verses 68 and 69, do you notice, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What's the alternative, he's saying? Now, that's a, a very good question. On the one hand, it's an important thing that Peter is saying. What's the alternative, he says? Now, let me say to you this evening, and I say it with a great sense of seriousness to you, if you are tempted to go back, if the pressures of the world and the flesh and the devil are upon you and you're tempted to backslide, I want to say to you, think about the alternative. Think long and think solemnly and think seriously about the alternative. To whom else shall we go, this, Peter said. What else is there, Lord? Because they had tasted something, you see, of the world to come. They had known something of the grace of God. And the thought of turning back, Peter says, where else shall we go? And you really do need to think, what lies down that road if I turn back? I met a man some time ago in another part of the world. The place, the circumstances don't greatly matter. He told me about an occasion of which I actually knew as it happened. When he had been at a conference, I suppose you would call it, when People had met together from all over the place for a week. And the truths of a biblical gospel were set out before them. He was just a postgraduate student at the time. Great promise. Great future ahead of him. And he said to me, I listened to them then. And that was the time I turned my back on evangelical Christianity. It was that week, he said. I could date it. You know how some of you date your conversion? Well, I can date that, he said. I tell you when it was. And I knew the occasion he was speaking about. He said, I turned back from all that. He wasn't saying it sadly. He was more boasting to me and said, I turned my back on evangelical Christianity then. Now you may wonder what the road was that he had gone down. You might be surprised to know. You might think I was going to tell you that he was a prosperous businessman or had landed in the gutter. No, neither of these. You know what he is? He's a professional theologian, teaching students. And just about the most bitter, sour, cynical, disappointed man I've ever met in all my life, with an amazing intellectual equipment to do it with. And I thought of that day 
Oh, I suppose it's 35 years ago. And how he probably didn't really think. To whom else shall we go? But you know, there is another sense to these words in which it's possible that Peter is saying to Jesus somewhat light-heartedly as Peter was in the habit of doing, and you could understand this, couldn't you? That he was saying, Lord, how shall we possibly go back, you know? As he said earlier on, if all men depart from you, I won't, Lord. You can count on Peter. And Jesus said to him, Have I not chosen, verse 70, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Arthur Pink, who comments on John's Gospel beautifully, has got a chapter practically in which he tells us the reasons Jesus chose Judas, and yet he was a traitor. But let me just give you one main reason, and it's this. I think it was to warn complacent Christians lest they didn't take this seriously enough. Oh Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe that you're the Holy One of God. Jesus said, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He was Judas. You know, Judas' great problem was that he was involved. Of course he was involved. Nobody could have been more involved. He was right out there at the front. But deep down, he was detached. You know, detached from the Master's deepest purposes for people's lives and for his. And he went about with the spirit of detachment. Even while they were out on some of these preaching missions and evangelistic occasions, deep down he was detached from the deepest purposes of the Master for his own life. And the day came when he betrayed Jesus. It's possible to be so involved and so near and yet deep down to be detached. Now, I said earlier on, you can't stagnate for very long. Not many of us here in this church tonight are stagnating Christians. We are either going on or we are going back. Before Christmas, my wife and I drove down to Durham to a university service. I wasn't very sure where we were going. It was an unfamiliar road to me, and I came off the motorway on the principle of that new proverb, you know, which says, he who hesitates finds that it's ten miles to the next exit. So I came off the motorway and came up to a roundabout. We weren't at all sure where we were going, and we went round the roundabout, to my wife's amusement, two or three times <laughs> until I found the right road to get out so that we might go on. I'm bound to tell you it struck me, even while I was driving, that there are so many of us who are going round in circles like that and getting nowhere. And you can't do it too long. You have the men with the luminous jackets after you if you do it in the motorway. 
But I tell you, if you go on doing that for too long, you will discover that you are going back. There is only one prophylactic against backsliding, and that's going on with Christ. It has never been brought home to me, more personally or more forcefully, than when I recollect reading a journal that my brother kept and which I've shared with some of you at a particularly crucial time of his life. He wrote these words which, when I read them, burned into my own soul. Lord, this piece of driftwood has drifted too long. By your grace, it shall drift no longer. Take me on. Take me on. This could be that kind of crossroads for you this evening. What's the shape of your future if you just go on the way you're going? Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also turn back? Let's pray. Father, you may have much to say to us this evening, personally and deeply in our own souls. And we bow before you and cry to you, Lord, Take us on, deliver us from the sheer crass folly of turning back and take us on for your great name's sake. Amen.